Good morning and welcome to this, the 11th meeting of the Equalities and Human Rights Committee of 2016. Can I make the usual request that your mobile phones are switched on to airplane mode on, or, or on silent? Um, moving swiftly into agenda item one this morning. Agenda item one is our draft budget, budget scrutiny and the focus of today's evidence is to hear from university equalities services and admission services uh, about the issues faced by disabled people and people use, who use British Sign Language as their their language for attending Scottish universities. Um, the, we will have BSL interpretation, so um, just the usual caveats about, and this is for me mostly, not to speak too fast, um, to, to allow them to, to, to sign properly. Can I uh, welcome our panel this morning? And we have Dr Jane Bamforth, who's the, uh, from the Conservatoire. She's a Conservatoire Councillor and Disability Advisor from the Royal Conservatoire of Scotland. Carol Baverstock, who is the Head of Admissions at the University of Aberdeen. Sheila Williams, the Director of Student Disability Services at the University of Edinburgh. Anne Duncan, who's the Disability Services Manager at the University of Strathclyde. And Kirsty Knox, who is the Assistant Head Recruitment, Admissions and Participation Services at the University of West of Scotland. Welcome all this morning to committee. We're really grateful for your attendance at committee this morning and, and grateful for for any written submissions that you've given us thus far. Um, we're, all, we're going to kick, kick straight into questions be, be, because we want to hear from you and, and, and hear some of your ideas that, that you have. We've had a, a huge amount of written evidence from uh, people who have, who have either accessed the services as um, students or have been members of staff. So we've got a real varied view of um, how people feel. We've got some submissions that are very positive and some that are maybe not, not so positive. So sort of looking at that and where the challenges arise, I wonder if the first opening question could be for you to give me a bit of insight into where you think some of the challenges are and what actions that your organisations have taken. Now, I know we have the chairs of um, the, the admissions and disability services, so general uh, questions about the, the whole service we, we may direct to, to, to you, but we're also interested in your institutions as well. So, I mean, I'm happy just for, for whoever to, to go first and, and give me some ideas of um, where they think the challenges are and what actions they're taking to address those challenges. Oh, Sheila. Thank you. Um, uh, speaking for the University of Edinburgh, um, you'll be aware that we're one of the largest and oldest universities in Scotland. So there are very specific challenges around our physical estate, the fact that we've got almost 300 buildings, some of which are listed, some of which are very old, um, and, and we do recognise that as an institution, and we are putting a lot of resource into um, the estate over the next um, year and beyond, including bringing in a company to audit all of our buildings and provide guides for access, but also egress for buildings, because there are some issues around um, if, if there's a fire ac evacuation drill. Excuse me, I've got the cold, so bear with me. <clears throat> I'll try not to splutter too much. Um, there are also, I mean, I think for, for Edinburgh and throughout the sector, one of the issues is around the whole kind of mainstreaming and inclusion agenda. And it's certainly something that we've looked at via our accessible and inclusive learning policy, which we introduced over three years ago. And the intention <coughs> behind that has been to mainstream support, which was previously only recommended for disabled students, <coughs> but now should be in place for all students. And I say should be, because it's still a work in progress. We still have a lot of work to do within our own institution to convince colleagues um, to put that support in, in place. Um, and I, I, I would be lying if I said it wasn't a constant challenge to get adjustments that certainly the University of Edinburgh Student Disability Service recommends for individual students that we need to get these put in place out in the schools. As, as I said, it's a very, very large institution. We've got 22 separate schools with different practices and different approaches. So we need to look at that. And the university actually is currently... Um, has a, a major disability review um, ongoing, which will re uh, report in February next year, which is looking at all of, of, all of these issues. Um, I would also say that in addition to the challenges, at least at Edinburgh, they have recognised that the challenges exist and the spend on student disability service has actually doubled over the last six, five to six years. So that's been a real positive that the, the institution has recognised 
that the numbers of students are growing, the numbers of complex issues around student support have grown, and the finance has been there to, to, to back up that growth. Has, has, that, has that proven itself through more students coming to Edinburgh and less students dropping out because of challenges with a disability? Have you got those? We've, we've certainly seen more and more students. Um, we have almost 3,500 students at the latest count for last academic year who disclosed uh, a disability. Um, and that's uh, both the sheer numbers and the proportion of the student cohort have just increased year on year on year. So it's not just that the, there are more students coming to the university, but the proportion of disabled students ha has grown, um, as I say, year on year, and shows no signs of, of slowing up, which is good. Yeah. Yeah. E e excellent. Some of the other institutions, if you... Jane? Uh, yeah, well, in contrast to Sheila, we're a very small institution with barely a 1,000 students, um, but as I, I put in my submission, we have about 28% of the student population have disclosed a disability um, <coughs> or a medical condition or specific learning difficulty. We have a, a very high percentage of students with dyslexia and specific learning difficulties, so um, about 15% of students with, with dyslexia and dyspraxia. Um, the numbers have grown hugely. I, um, since I started in post in 1998, there were uh, about 10 students who disclosed a disability. And um, last year, there were 293. So the Conservatoire has worked very hard at becoming more, um, more accessible and to be seen to be accessible for, for applicants and students with disabilities. I think our challenges are that we're dealing with some very um, <coughs> traditional, if I can say, uh, art forms, um, music, <coughs> opera, and so a bit like Sheila said, sometimes the, the challenge is, is making sure that, that all staff, um, including perhaps the one-to-one -one teaching staff, um, are, are on board, are taking on the adjustments that, that need to be made. So whether you're teaching your student the violin or you're rehearsing them in an opera, adjustments need to be, need to be made. And sometimes just because of the perhaps traditional nature of those, of those art forms, um, the, the idea of adjustments doesn't always come easily. Uh, Sheila. Sorry, I'm just, Sorry. I'm just going to, I'm just, I was just going to go round, round, round the table and, and, and allow everyone to have, have, the, have their say. Anne. So, uh, yeah, at the University of Strathclyde, um, some of our issues do reflect uh, the issues that Sheila has uh, communicated in relation to Edinburgh. Um, we have a very, very large campus on the <coughs> one of what's professed to be the steepest hills in uh, Glasgow City. Um, so we have huge challenges in relation to um, the physical estate. That has been addressed through estate redevelopment. Um, all our new buildings, you know, we're making sure they're in, as accessible as is humanly possible. So there is the challenges of the physical estate. I think um, we're also experiencing growing numbers. Um, since I've been at Strathclyde six years ago, uh, in the past six years, we have gone from 1,200 students to <coughs> over 1,600 students with disabilities. What we're also finding is the categories of disabilities are changing. There's particularly there's been an increase in mental health disclosure, which reflects, I know it's reflective of the sector as a whole. Um, and we've also had a significant increase in the number of students presenting with autistic spectrum disorders. Obviously, both of this, these are wholly and entirely positive. Um, are, and we see it, you know, it's great that people and students are choosing to disclose and, you know, it suggests that there is less stigma associated with mental health disclosure. However, what we are finding is 
the, some of these conditions are probably conditions that um, staff across the university feel less equipped to support. It's not as it's not particular for our academic colleagues. It's not as it's not often seen as easy to support some of these students because of the nature of their conditions. Their you know conditions can be fluctuating. They can be intermittent. You could perhaps have a plan to support them, and then a student experiences a bad episode of mental health, and the plan goes completely out of the window and we need to start from scratch again so that can be a particular challenge and I feel that staff and central support services are um, you know this is their bread and butter they're quite comfortable and confident in you know supporting these students but obviously students spend the majority of their time in their academic department so it's really trying to work with a very large academic community to try and equip them really to feel proficient, uh, or to feel sufficiently confident in their support of these students. I definitely feel that the, in our experience at Strathclyde, there is a willingness without a doubt, and you know, staff definitely feel that they want to support these students to succeed, but sometimes they feel that they are more ill-equipped to support some of these kind, of, these categories of disabilities when it's it's not perceived as as straightforward a student case. Yeah, is there training available for, for those staff? Because a key theme that's come that's emerged through the evidence that we've had is is some students feeling they would be much more confident in in, in the, the the lecture <coughs> room or in you know classes when um, they. they for instance, we, ha we have evidence from a, a student that uses BSL as a language who felt their university experience would have been much better if the, the lecturer had had some BSL or, uh, he, he, you know, deaf awareness training. Yeah. So the same with mental health, the same with yeah. other disability training. What, what's available for staff? Yeah, there is, um, there is in, within our institution, we have disability awareness training and there is mental health awareness training as well. Um, uptake varies um, and how we would address it, particularly for um, BSL users or students who are deaf, is if we have a student who is deaf, we will work with the academic department that they will be in to work with that group of um, academic staff to know you know, to have a level of deaf awareness, that's how it's approached within the institution. But I and I assume that my colleagues across the table would, you know, there's definitely scope for doing a lot more. Yeah, you said take, take ups, um, you know, varied. Varied, yes. Um, is, is there any moves as far as CPD for um, academic staff to, to make some of this training mandatory for their academic, uh, you know, their, their year on year CPD? Sorry, uh, can I say that the University of Edinburgh is very conscious of the, the support that academic colleagues require with regard to mental health. Um, so we've instituted, in, in conjunction with um, one of the senior academics who's driven the project, a fortnightly uh, Wednesday afternoon training session for each school within the university for personal tutors um, and student support officers who are the kind of key admin people in many of the schools. However, I also recognise what Anne's highlighted about engagement and attendance. Um, certainly there has been at Edinburgh a bit of discussion about making that training mandatory. Um, it currently is not mandatory, but I think I speak for many of my student services colleagues who, say, who, would, who would agree that we would like it to be so. Yeah, I'm going to, going to open out to questions. Jeremy. Uh, good morning and thank you all very much for coming along. Uh, I've got maybe just three or four questions, um, if that's okay. Um, I'll keep them brief. Uh, the first one is picking up that final point by you, Sheila, is, I mean, I have no doubt that at, at Edinburgh University and at the other universities across Scotland that what you're saying is, is right at the top. You know, the principal, the, the, the chancellor, the court all agree with everything that you have said. But if you dig down to a lecturer in a particular school, 
it's just not getting there. Uh, and there's something missing, I think, between your department and, if I can say, the average lecturer at any university. And how do we bridge that gap? Because it's all very well having policies and bits of paper, but if it's making no difference to the average student's experience, then frankly, you know, we're wasting our time. And so how do you see we can bridge the gap between what you want to do and how we do it? Um, that's a very good question. Um, and it's one that we're, uh, well, we've, we've constantly grappled with and we continue um, to do so. Um, we are looking via the disability review that I mentioned earlier at that very issue. And I think we recognise that key to the process is, is further engagement between the Student Disability Service and each of the academic schools. Uh, I think there are issues around um, governance and uh, maybe a higher profile for some of the issues that Student Disability Services are concerned with and the support of disabled students. I think there can be perhaps um, uh, a situation arises where many academic colleagues, or some academic colleagues, I, sh I shouldn't generalise, see a disabled student as the primary responsibility of the disability service. Whereas we are very much about saying, no, these students are the University of Edinburgh students, we all have a responsibility here and we all need to do what we need to do, whether it's in the legislative context or whether it's just good practice or the right thing to do. So I think what we'll be looking at specifically will be ways of further engaging with our individual um, schools, uh, probably starting from next year, actually. Um, we, we do, I mean, I, I, I don't want to s suggest that we don't engage with schools. Mm -hmm. We do, um, but we, we recognise that that has to happen in a much more meaningful way. <coughs> Second question, and it's assumed that whoever wants to jump in and take it. Um, we got a very helpful breakdown of, if you like, listening for different types of disability <coughs> that might come to the university. <coughs> and, and clearly the highest number of people, I think across every institution, is those that would have dyslexia or ADH or... And, and I think that's very good. And I think probably universities are by and large pretty well set up for that type of condition. But my question is, how do you deal with the more complex ones? So I asked this question last week, is there a hierarchy of disability? So if I've got dyslexia, well, we can cope with that. But if I've got a multiple disability, physical disability, whatever, well, they're more difficult to deal with. So, we, so how, in your experience amongst the schools of your universities, is there a hierarchy of disability? And you were not in one way or the other. I can, uh, I'll jump in with that in terms of, and yeah, you're absolutely right. I think dyslexia and specific learning difficulties is um, definitely the, um, the category of disabilities that most institutions are best equipped to, um, to deal with. Um, in terms of how we respond to um, students with more complex um, disabilities. Uh, our approach is very much it's trying to get in there as early as possible. Um, so I'll give you an example from a, a case I worked on a few years ago which illustrates our approach um, very well. We were involved in an open day um, at, at Stratlides Open Day a couple of years ago, and we were met with a, um, one uh, an applicant who had multiple. He was quadriplegic, significant, um, significant complex difficulties. He would need personal care support. Would need a complete package of support. So our approach was that open day was probably September October for application or entry the following year. So from that point onwards, we engaged with that student to ascertain as early as possible what support that student may require. Now the approach, it was a supportive approach. It was in no way to um, deter or discourage the student or, or influence the uh, prospect of the student being offered a place. The student was offered a place. He chose to go elsewhere. But the early inter intervention was key because for that support package, the student need like we needed to look at adapting accommodation. We needed to look at whether his uh, social 
work package would be transferred because we're in Glasgow, the student was Edinburgh based. Um, there was engagement with the academic department right from the start because the student was applying for, um, it was a chemistry course, it was quite a practical course and the student had um, no use of his upper limbs um, and we worked very well with the department. The department and the student were very forthcoming in terms of suggestions to how to mitigate the uh, uh, impact that this condition would have on his participation on the course. Um, he was central to all of this. The academic department were very, very supportive in terms of thinking of different ways of adapting their teaching um, to make it wholly and entirely accessible for that student. Um, we were fully confident that the student, in terms of his uh, support, um, it was workable um, and the student felt quite reassured that if he did choose to come to Strathclyde that he um, would have had the necessary support in place. Um, so illustrating that is my point here is that it's the early intervention. We do, we, we are lucky in terms of we have very, very good systems where we can, we start looking at our applicant data very, very early on, like it's March, April for the September intake, and we do prioritise based on complexity of difficulty. So if you have a mobility impairment, a hearing impairment, or a visual impairment, we will be contacting the students as part and part of the course by April, May time for entry in August, September. Can I be devil's advocate for a moment, Anne, and say yeah. if 10 people had turned up with yeah. that condition, could you have coped? Or because it was one, that, yeah. that was fine? I, and I, I think it's a very yeah. clear question. I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to accuse you of not, but I yeah. think what is the uh -huh. level that you can cope with? Yeah, I would agree that if 10 students, if 10 applicants with that level yep. of complexity, like that was, you know, students with that kind of support package, we wouldn't be presented with one every year. But if we were to be met with that in the multiples of 10, we would really, really struggle. Okay. Yeah, I think so. Just two very quick questions, and I will be quite honest. Um, can I ask about coursework and when people are actually at the university? Because obviously people have different disabilities and how they cope with coursework exams will vary. Uh, are your colleagues open to changing how, we, how students are assessed or is it very much, this is how we've always done it, we do an exam at the end of the year and that's it? Or is there an openness to saying this person has got a disability, he or she is very capable, but we may not just be able to cope with that top of, type of assessment? Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. <laughs> can I, can I because this, this will be quite interesting yeah, in as far yeah. as the, the, the different types of assessments that, that, that you would do as compared to maybe the um, other ones. Yes, yeah, so we, we offer a, a wide range of adjustments to assessments. Um, we, we meet with every student who's disclosed a disability for what we call a learning agreement at the start of the, the student's course. And the, the meetings <coughs> between myself, the student, and the head of department or programme leader and we go through the assessments um, and the coursework elements of that student's course and look at any adjustments that, that would be required. So we are, I think we, it's fair to say we are very flexible. Um, we don't insist on written assignments. Students can present, in, um, can present an, audio, um, as, um, an audio submission. Or, or a video submission, if that's if that's easier, students can they can specify if there's a particular time of day that suits them better for a performance, um, which is very helpful for students with mental health conditions or medical conditions. Um, we we and if a student um, is is struggling, we can provide a bespoke assessment calendar. So we can push assessments sort of out of the, um, the set assessment diets um, for, for students. And so yeah, I, I think we are, we are 
flexible in, and open to looking at other ways. If a student, for example, from the performing point of view, we, we have accepted um, recordings. If a student finds it too, um, too nerve-wracking or um, mentally um, not, not possible to, to perform in the, in the hall, then we will accept a, a recording as a, as a performance assessment. Um, we, are, we are always open to, to flexible assessments, I would say. Um, yes, at, at the University of Edinburgh, there, there are a number of imaginative and flexible approaches which have been implemented in the past. Um, I suppose because we operate in a more traditional academic sphere, um, there are uh, different courses. There, there, there's a variety and a, perhaps a, um, an inconsistency of approach, and it may depend on the subject area. Uh, it may depend on um, how things have been done for uh, you know, the last 30 years, for instance. Um, but uh, yes, we, do, we, we can, um, on occasion, our academic colleagues will um, set um, an essay instead of an exam in some uh, subject areas. And slightly different from Jane because it's a, it's a different context, but we will, we will look at different ways of doing things. But it's also true to say that I, I think um, we are still fairly wedded to exams uh, and a number of students will get things like extra time or be able to sit their exams in a, a smaller room or a room on their own. So we'll, we'll be as supportive as we can and sometimes certain supports are easier to recommend and be put in place than, than others. I suppose just my final question is in regard to, I mean, I think it's all very positive what you're hearing. There will be some students who simply won't be able to presumably accommodate. Um, when I was at Edinburgh, which was, I appreciate, back in the dark ages, uh, the school I was at was just, if you were in a wheelchair, it just wasn't able to get in by a wheelchair. Mm -hmm. if, when you assess someone and you find you cannot meet their needs, where do you signpost them on to? Or, or how would you deal with an individual who, for whatever reason, because of a disability, you simply couldn't accommodate them. What support do you give them and what signposting? Um, I, to be honest, that's never occurred in, in my time there, or not, not to my knowledge within the, the disability service. It, it, it's, and that's not to deny that there are, there are challenges, um, particularly for wheelchair users. Um, I mean, I suppose referring back to your early po earlier point about the hierarchy of disability, I don't think there's a hierarchy, but I think um, some of the issues that we deal with on a societal level are actually mirrored in higher education, and some of them are, are perhaps more complex because of the subject nature of, of the issues that, that, that are being taught. But to get back to the physical access issue, what we will do is... Um, if a building isn't accessible, we we'll recommend that the classes are held uh, in, a, in a different building. Um, so that can be quite a significant uh, disruption on occasion for, for um, certain classes. Or we can look at broadcasting um, remotely. So there's a whole range of things that we would look at. I, I'd hate to think that we would be turning somebody away on, on that basis, whilst also recognising that, that yeah, Edinburgh's physical estate is, is less than ideal. Thank Carol, you. with your admissions hat on and your general overview of admissions mm. across, being, being, being the, 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 the chair, mm. yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, is that something from an admissions point of view where, you know, Jeremy's issue that he's, he's raised here around um, access? access? Yes. Um, um, certainly, I mean, obviously, I can, I can speak with some experience with regard to the University of Aberdeen. And like Edinburgh, we do have an estate that's been around for 600 years plus. Um, but we also have a lot of facilities that are very modern and 
you know, um, accessible. And we do have uh, areas of the university that are assigned to particular disciplines, for example. Um, but that tends to house the academics and the support staff. It doesn't necessarily mean that that's where laboratory work takes place or lectures or seminars. So like Edinburgh, we would be looking to ensure that we can have uh, give the student an alternative experience um, and we would ensure that um, their physical locality for their seminars and tutorials would be in buildings that are accessible. And in fact, most of our main uh, spaces for teaching um, students and delivering lectures and tutorials and that kind of thing uh, are in accessible buildings. Um, where we've encountered in the past, um, we've had, for example, some students with mobility issues who are looking for particular courses that might involve a field trip, for example. Um, and that has presented in the past, and therefore, um, Students are obviously coming in and they're studying a degree programme um, of which courses make up that degree on a year-by-year -year basis. And those courses, some of them are compulsory and some of them um, the student self-selects. So we are looking to ensure that if a student, um, whether it's compulsory or self-selecting, to do something like a field course um, and there's physical... Um, restrictions, then there would be an alternative experience. So the university would expect that that alternative experience would be worked through, um, and that would be through our um, disability advisors working with um, the relevant school within the university, working with the student themselves and looking how that alternative experience can be achieved because at the end of the day we're looking to ensure that, that they can have the experience so that the necessary outcomes for that course are achieved and there are numerous ways of achieving the outcome. Um, from an application perspective, just touching uh, Jeremy, on one of your comments, that your questions earlier, uh, I think one of the challenges that, that that probably presents to all institutions is very much a keenness that <coughs> applicants at the application stage feel comfortable and able to declare their disability. And for students who are presenting perhaps with complex disabilities or multiple disabilities, there's a general um, understanding that they are they are normally presented in the application process. So we are encouraging early disclosure because we are looking to work with the applicant at an early stage to ensure that we can make the required um, adjustments um, and give support as appropriate and engage with the applicant and their wider family as appropriate. But we do find that some disabilities um, and obviously dyslexia was mentioned as being one that universities are fairly adapted <coughs> at being able to accommodate, um, are not being disclosed at the application stage. And they are being um, realised when the student arrives and registers at the university. Now, obviously, the universities work to ensure that the adjustments, appropriate adjustments, are, are made, but perhaps the applicant has not had um, the best experience that they might have had in the lead up to university entry because we've not been able to give them the support that we could have given. Yeah, one clear element from the evidence we took last week was about the UCAS system being much more respons responsive to this. I'm going to bring in Alex. Cole. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming to see us today. Uh, my question, my, well, I've got two questions, the first of which uh, really stems from your comments just now, Carol, and it's great to have you here because uh, Aberdeen is my alm alma mater. And um, I was uh, president of the SRC, um, at, well, just at the turn of the millennium, actually, okay. a long time ago now. But um, I sat on the university court, and there was a big discussion at that time um, about not so much about access, but mm -hmm. about um, retention and yes. attrition. And I just wondered if you could um, offer some comments about 
what mechanisms, if any, you employ to keep students in post once we've got them there, particularly if they're affected by disability, um, so that, you know, everybody, you know, every university has people who drop out, and that's just part of university life. But what efforts do you make to, to retain those students, particularly those with more complex needs? Um, yes, I mean, retention is a, a, a keen topic amongst, you know, all universities. There's a lot of, a lot of involvement and effort goes on to ensure that, the, you know, the student arrives and registers, and you want that experience to be a very positive one for the students. Um, we're certainly uh, have quite uh, an initiative and drive within the university um, from from our university principal um, across all of our schools um, in the university to look at retention. There is no one particular aspect um, of relating to students that links um, or is the cause of, of not being able to keep students at the university. And we are looking very much at um, bringing together lots of different aspects of the university, looking to um, what is given to students um, before they arrive and register at the university. Because yes, we give lots of information. We have websites, we have um, prospectuses, and they will come along to visit days and applicant days. Um, but it's very much, it's a different landscape university. We speak a, a different language, the terminology we use and, and, and what students have, have to, to navigate. Um, so we're looking at lots of different initiatives. I, I can't give specifics, but I'm aware the university is looking at lots of different initiatives to ensure that students feel that they're able to um, stay with their studies and also to ensure that if they have queries and questions, issues, problems, that they have the relevant signposts to ensure that they can access those services. So it's about giving multiple, um, multiple pieces of information at multiple points and not just a single, well, this is your handbook and you can find all the answers um, available. We have developed a personal tutor scheme which has moved away from what you might have experienced was the advisor of study um, scheme and that's very much linked as a, a designated <coughs> academic member of staff who is there for that particular student not simply from an academic perspective but is there to support the student in any aspect of university university life so Thank you. A named person, almost. Yeah. No, well, well. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> Sorry. Did you want to? Um, yeah, just to say, um, to follow on from what Carol was saying, I think um, for us, early intervention is, is key. Um, we, um, we track students' absences, and if a, a student has more than a certain number of absences, then then they are asked to come along for an, what's called an investigatory meeting just to see um, if there, there are things that are not, not going well, if more support needs to be put in place, if the support that's been provided isn't working. Um, we, we also, um, the learning agreements that I, I described earlier, I contact all students with disabilities who have a learning agreement in January to, to ask if those are, are working well, if they would like to review um, the learning agreement and the support. And then in February, we have progress committee, which I sit on, where all students, um, the, the progress of all students through, through their course is, is looked at. And, um, and any, any student who is not doing well, again, if they have a learning agreement that's checked, that's noted, the student will then be contacted and invited to a review um, of the learning agreement and support. And then at the end of the, the year, we have our special circumstances board, which happens um, just before the exam board. And again, all students with disabilities are, are looked at. Um, and any, any student who is, is not doing well, again, the learning agreement and support is, is checked and any issues are noted. So. So we, we do, um, and because, we're, because of the numbers, because the numbers are small, obviously I realize that, that this is perhaps a luxury that we have, 
but we are able to, to personally sort of track every student. Thank you. Um, my second question um, is, speaks to the student experience. We heard, we were reminded last week um, very eloquently that, uh, that actually, you know, lectures only fulfill, in my case, if you're an arts graduate, uh, sometimes only nine hours a week are devoted to lectures. And whilst the university may be very good at providing adaptations, uh, interpreters, if it's a, a BSL situation, um, or, or any other kind of mitigating uh, support to students with disabilities, that those nine hours really are actually very, just a, a, very much a small part of that student experience. And when they talk about the sort of um, wider university life, including societies and um, club nights and the, the range and myriad of opportunities and experiences for students to have, that it's at that point which many students are, are left out. And in fact, the reflection was quite stark from the panel last week that Scotland doesn't have an institution within it that really ticks all those boxes. There are institutions in the rest of the UK which manage to, to bridge that gap. But actually, it's in that wider student experience um, element that we are potentially failing. And I just wondered if the panel could give us their reflections on that view. Kirsty, do, do you want to come in at this point? Sure. Just admissions and, and, and having a university that's spread across a few different campuses with yeah. different types of accommodation as well. Yeah, um, thank you. Um, we certainly do have um, a number of challenges, given that we've now got kind of five campus locations and obviously four based in Scotland. And we try and make sure, and we do endeavour um, at the moment to make sure the approach is as consistent as possible. Uh, what we've certainly um, had in the last few years um, is invested a huge amount into the structure within the schools and support for students, not just students with disabilities. Um, we did a pilot a few years ago. We had a, a school um, enhancement developer for students. So we felt as though the touching points for <coughs> students were quite minimal and to have an engagement point throughout the academic cycle in terms of you know, attending classes, assessment, you know, workshops, etc. And that pilot was very successful. Now we have a school enhancement development, enhancement developer within every single school. And within each school, we also have an education guidance advisor. And they all work very closely together that for any students that need to have guidance and counselling, there is a member of staff available. If a student that's got a disability, they have a named disability advisors. And we try to make sure there's a, tr sort of a triangulation of everyone joining together with things and not saying we're perfect at doing it. Um, but that is the approach we are striving um, towards. Um, we've also introduced, in terms of the university, kind of the ultimate student experience that all universities try to um, strive towards. Um, we've introduced um, a Students at Welcome Festival, and we run that at each campus. And it's very much, you know, the senior members of staff are very much present at it. And um, we try and have every single aspect from student services. We have funding available. We have a disability team available. Um, student um, association, everyone is there. And it's our societies, it's our clubs. To promote to every single student that there's so much more than just the academic side of things. Within, um, recently, we've had a brand new air campus development. So in terms of accessibility, that's second to none. Um, Paisley Campus, we've gone through a massive amount of development with our new principal coming into post. And very much we have a student hub that's in the, the ground floor. It's right next to um, funding advisor, disability services. So very much focusing on the student experience. It's the heart of the centre of the university. And that is replicated at Dumfries Campus, also at Air Campus. And obviously now we are looking forward to the Lanarkshire Campus, which 2018, we're striving towards that. And again, that'll have the same approach. So we certainly have invested a huge amount in the last few years in focusing on the university experience for all of our students, putting the student at the heart of everything that we do. Um, we're recently taking on um, the International Student Barometer for all of our students, and that'll be the first year we'll go into that. And we do the student satisfaction survey, so we always analyse our, our, our information that we get from that. But from an admissions application perspective, I do lose <coughs> with our disability team, and I certainly find that we contact our students or our potential students at the point they have a confirmation decision. And we've certainly found similar to Carol is that a lot of the students don't believe they have a disability if they have dyslexia. They don't declare it, they don't disclose it. So we find that induction and enrolment, they, they come up to talk to the team and the support is put into place. And again, they're given an, an, a named contact from that. Um, but what we certainly find is that it's making it ourselves known at that point. And um, sometimes the students, 
um, don't want to be identified, same as care leavers, they don't want the stigma of being identified. For anyone that does go forward to disability advisors, we then have a six month review with them to sort of find is there anything else we need to put into place. And it's having that continual review. Um, but from a UWS perspective, we certainly have reviewed everything from the start to the end. And there's so much more we can still bring into place, but we're moving very much in the right direction. And um, it's a positive thing for UWS. On, on the, the back of Alex's question about the whole university experience, we had some evidence last week, and we've had it mm -hmm. in written evidence as well, from <coughs> BSL users who can't access the Freshers' Week mm -hmm. or the festivals or yes. things like that because there's not an interpretation service available for them at that point. Um, and therefore, when they get into class, they've all bonded and they feel left out. So that, that was a very, very clear element of the, the oral evidence we had last week and some, some written evidence. Is there any work being done to ensure that that very first stage of, of making friends, of building in relationships and you know he you know he was told in the first class pair off and everybody paired off and he was left in his own yeah we certainly have um a kind of a one-on-one -on -one off process uh, policy uh, for say a deaf student that has to have an interpreter and so that they're, they're always have someone with them as we endeavour to work towards that what the disability team have noticed is that are identified to me is that there's a lack of interpreters there's a shortage and the team leader is actually going through um sign language um, training herself, but she's doing that independently of the university, so it's quite interesting the discussion they learn about training and development. Mm -hmm. um, I also asked um, how many members of staff within the university within student services had disability, and we have one member of staff just now that is um, blind, and go, but we don't have any deaf members of staff. Um, but yes, we try to make sure that the student experience is replicated um, I'm not saying it's perfect, but we do try to make sure that there's situations put into place that they are engaging with the rest of the student body. Yeah, thank you. I think just, just if I could come in on, as a bookend on that, one of the things I was really struck by was that when, when I asked if there was an example of an institution in the British Isles or a further afield which got this right, um, the one that came back to us was Preston. And part of that was because they reached a critical mass where because um, students with hearing loss recognised that it was a good university to go to in terms of wider provision, more and more deaf students sort of gravitated towards Preston, which in, you know, added to a virtuous cycle of investment in resources for it. So that it, it almost sort of built itself, as it were. Definitely. I think, I mean, my role's expanded in the last few months to take on all of sort of recruitment missions and participation, not all of it, I've got a head of department, but for me, I'm now asking questions in terms of applicant information sessions, open days, what extra support do we need to put into place to highlight the support services that we have for these students that are coming onto the university, and not just the Paisley campus, but every single campus that we have in the university. So it's, it's for me, it's, it's a really exciting time to take things forward at the university. Okay, I'm going to move on. Mary. Um, thank you um, and good morning everyone. A lot of um, what I wanted to, to ask has already been covered. Um, but can I ask the panel about the application um, process itself? Because I was, I was quite struck by the um, submission, and I think it's from Edinburgh University, um, when you say that you're not aware of any issues which have been drawn to our attention. Uh, and then you go on to talk about reasonable adjustments. Um, and I have to say, I was quite disturbed by the use of the word permitted. Um, someone was permitted to submit an application. But c can I ask the panel in general, what work has been done to ensure that the application process is easy and accessible to everyone? Is there any equality proofing done? Is there any testing? Is there any checking? that regardless of your disability, you will be able to complete the application so that you're not in a position where you have to ask for help. I think it'll be fair, Sheila, to let you come back in that one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, yes, apologies for the use of the word permitted. That's a very good point. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think what, what all institutions continue to grapple with is the fact that um, under the Equality Act, we have an anticipatory duty, which we're... Again, it ties into the mm. whole kind of long-term aim of, of being much more inclusive and mainstreaming as much as possible, although that won't ever take away from the need for certain individual um, support. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't want to go into too much detail about the admissions process because I'm not totally familiar mm. with it other than um, 
at Edinburgh, we, the disability information is not taken into account in terms of whether an offer is mm. made. Th that's not really the point I'm trying to Sorry, get at. How, what work has been done to ensure that someone is completing the application or the admissions process, that they will be able to complete it, understand it, and won't have any problem with it? I don't think I'm best placed to answer that from an Edinburgh perspective. Actually, it would probably be my admissions colleagues mm. who would... Well, maybe Carol, as an admissions yeah. person, would, would, would be able to answer uh, that. Yes, I can try, can try and answer that. I mean, obviously, um, for students looking to do undergraduate study in the United Kingdom, the application process is not directly to each university that they're interested in. Mm. The application process is through UCAS, and UCAS facilitate um, the delivery of the applications to each of the choices mm -hmm. that an applicant has made. Now, they um, do a lot, a lot of user testing. Um, not just in terms of the accessibility of the application, but also in terms of the terminology that they're using. So down at Cheltenham, uh, where UCAS are based, they bring in uh, testers and users and they monitor every aspect of their experience as they are going through the application. So when there's hesitation over perhaps terminology, um, then there's further probing as to what, why, why mm. did they not go further forward? Because obviously, again, as I've mentioned, there's a lot of terminology used um, that is commonplace in, in universities and the application mm. procedure, which is not necessarily understood by those that are looking to go and mm -hmm. have that experience. Um, not everybody would appreciate what undergraduate means or what postgraduate means. Um, <coughs> UCAS have developed their services over you know, many, many years. They've moved away from a paper submission um, and by and large, everything is online. They are further enhancing their products, um, moving to more uh, of a dig digital um, process. Um, and they are engaging as wide as possible with different their different stakeholders. So obviously, Applicants are key to their business, as are schools and colleges, as are advisors, as are um, universities and colleges. So as they're developing their services, um, at the moment, they um, have finished developing services for postgraduate study, um, and they are uh, currently developing services in terms of being able to find out about information about universities and what the course mm. involves and everything, but also their undergraduate application services. So that involves engaging with the wider groups and getting feedback. So they are building and listening, taking feedback, mm. um, adjusting modifying so it's not a case of we've developed a product we think it's great please use it it's very much engaging with the, the, mm. those that are going to be using it both at the front end and at the back end um, to try and ensure that 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 it's it's doing its job okay that's very reassuring does anyone else want to comment Add in in terms of the um, engagement that UCAS mm -hmm. has you know, with the universities. Um, I am part of the UCAS undergraduate advisory group and I sit on that committee with um, the head of admissions for um, Edinburgh. And we then feed into, we have um, Scottish universities. What is our group called? Universities admissions practitioners, practitioners group. Thank you. <laughs> um, and so Ian and I then feed back the information um, to the group to sort of see what the developments are for UCAS. UCAS are also having at the moment because they're doing so many developments on their products. And um, they have webinars. Um, it's each Wednesday morning, I think every fortnight, mm. and we can all participate. And then we can view the sessions afterwards. So again, as Carol says, it's not just UCAS devising a product and running with it. They do try and to engage with us, mm. and they bring in student testers. Um, so again, as a sector, we're very lucky that we do have a very much a voice mm. in how the products are moving forward. Okay, thanks for that. And I've just got one very, very brief um, question. Um, and I can't remember if it, it was either Sheila or Anne spoke about awareness training. Um, and I wonder if you could perhaps give me a bit more information as to how in-depth that awareness training is. 
Um, it was, yeah. uh, it, was Sorry, um, it was myself. Um, well, we've a range of uh, training initiatives mm -hmm. um, for disability awareness uh, within the university, and they vary from short two-hour workshops to um, there is a more um, in-depth program called Developing an Inclusive Curriculum, um, which is an accredited module which um, academics undertake and they are certificated um, at the end of it and it involves um, participation. It's over, it's four half day sessions and they have to complete a uh, support and course work for that. So it goes in to quite a lot of detail on the development of inclusive teaching practice within the university. So it varies from the generic basic to the much more in-depth and I would say as well um, the mental health awareness training as well it, um, it varies from short one-off workshops to more detailed we've had um, more training facilitated recently the um, Scottish mental health first aid training that's been delivered within the university as well so there is there's both kind of light brush and the more detailed, um, uh, the, the more content available. So there's a range. And, and does it give information on dealing with physical disabilities? Does it cover every type of disability? Um, yes, um, particularly the, um, the disability awareness sessions mm. would be focused very much on the different, the, you know, looking at our student population and considering the barriers to participation that this student group would uh, face and what we as an institution need to do. Um, as I had mentioned earlier, when there is a particular <coughs> category of disability, like for example, when an academic department is going to have a British Sign Language user, mm -hmm. we will work with that academic department. It will be on a more informal basis, but they will have training and development, but it'll be very much specific and focused on that individual student's needs mm -hmm. as well. We'll do something very similar with um, working with students who are blind or visually impaired as well. Like we do have we do have a rolling program of training workshops, you know, that we deliver kind of three or four times a year. Mm -hmm. But then we will do kind of the tailored, specific courses, um, working with individual academic department when that need has been identified by the, you know, the identification of a new student. Okay, thanks for that. And, and do other institutions do the same type of awareness training? Yeah, absolutely. We we'll, um, very much similar to to what Anne's outlined at, at Edinburgh. Um, we'll, we'll do tailor-made training for individual mm. schools on request um, and impairment-specific um, range of, mm. of training. We're just about to update our deaf awareness mm. training as we now have a disability advisor who, who's a BL, BSL um, practitioner, so that's going to be a real mm. advantage for us. Um, but, yeah, we'll, we'll do whatever... Um, whatever um, colleagues would like us to do, basically, but that's within our remit. Okay. Okay. Yes, um, similarly, um, we have a, a le learning and teaching conference every year and part of, part of that, um, it's, it's open to all staff and part of that conference is given over to um, disability awareness training. Um, so we had um, the NUS Scotland mental health officer um, in this, this year to give to give um, mental health training. Um, we've had Scottish Autism um, to provide um, training on, for, on ASDs, um, the RNIB. So it's, it's again, it's a, a rolling programme. Mm -hmm. Also, if there are any specific requests from departments, then we can organise that as well. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Valley like Coffee. Thanks very much, convener, uh, and hello, everybody. Um, could I go back to this point about um, uh, students with a disability making application to your institution? And do you think there's a, a common standard, let's say, that students with a disability can expect? Uh, I'm raising this because of the point that Alec Colt Hamilton made about specialist institutions down south somehow attracting students with disabilities, and therefore 
students with a disability would reject. Other institutions in the basis for that, is it like that in Scotland or is there a common level of service across all the colleges and universities that, that, that students could feel comfortable in applying to each and every one of you? I think that falls to you, Carol. <laughs> um, in terms of a publicised common approach, um, there probably isn't one as such. However, those working in admissions and admissions practitioners and those responsible for making decisions are very much looking to ensure for all applicants that there's fair practice. So there's a code um, of practice to ensure that essentially applications that are received and are received on time via UCAS are all treated equally, are all given the same consideration. And I think you'll find most universities, yes, we are working within constraints, but by and large, we are looking to see how can we make an offer of admission to the applicant that we're looking at. Um, and certainly at Aberdeen, our academic ad ad admission selectors um, work very hard to do that. Admission setups within each university are not the same. So at Aberdeen, we have what we would call centralised admissions, and we have dedicated academic members of staff who are experienced and qualified to be looking at applications across a broad area. So we admit to the degree of MA, the degree of BSc, um, and whilst the applicant is applying for a particular subject within those areas, we have consistency applied regardless of whether it's anthropology, MA, or sociology, MA. Um, we generally will look to ensure that we can make an offer of admission. So if the candidate is presenting because through the Scottish education system, <coughs> lots of applicants may well have achieved their um, university qualifications at the end of S5. But obviously under Curriculum for Excellence, we're looking across the S4 to S6 experience. So those who meet what we would uh, present as our minimum entry requirements, um, you would not be asking any more further qualifications from them. Those that, that haven't met or haven't quite met, the selectors, and again, I think most universities will be the same, are looking to see, well, they're not quite there. Can they get there? And if they can't get there, is there an explanation? So disability might be one aspect, but there's lots of other aspects of contextual data. So adjustments may well be made in the offer making. So for example, um, you know, the disability or the circumstances of the student and their achievements <coughs> to date may well be quite significant, may well not be quite what we're looking for, but in their um, application, their achievement is quite significant and that is demonstrating an ability for further success. So uh, adjusted offer making may well go on after that you know, to, to, to take account for, for the information that it, that it is presented. Um, generally, we'll use the information in the application to allow us to make that decision. So we are reliant on the personal statement and we're also reliant on the information that's provided in the reference. And you'll find that universities will possibly have different approaches as to how they use that information. Look, thank, thanks for that. I wonder, before MD else answers that, could I just clarify what I mean, really mean by this? Supposing I'm a student with a disability applying or thinking about applying to U5, right? Um, how do I get an impression about the support that you each offer me before I even begin the journey of trying? I mean, all these sports yes. services are great, but it's kind of after the event, isn't it? Yes. It's about making the choice to either go to one of your institutions because, it, for me, it seems the best one, and there's a great level of support. What do you? How do you offer that at the outset? 
to your students Custody. with disability. Mm -hmm. yeah. One thing, I was involved in a meeting yesterday with our transition advisors and they work um, with our college partners on the move from for HNC and HND students coming into the university. And what we're going to arrange, I think, for me next year is having a college awareness session. Uh, we have a student recruitment team that engage with secondary schools and go out and do school talks. But it's more the provision of our academic portfolio. Um, so again, I will be looking at the extra side of things as well. Um, but in terms of the transition day we're going to have for me, it will have, because the college advisors want to know about our admissions processes, how we look at the applications. They want to know what's available on campus. So again, it will be student services, it will be funding, it will be disabilities. And by having those sessions, we're then going to be having that kind of May, but then we're going to have college sessions for students. Um, we're looking for October. We recently had a set of them last month, but we felt they were quite late in the calendar, so bring them in for October. So we feel as we're working with the colleges uh, to let them know what services we have available, and we're going to do that um, next year and look at sort of Paisley and Air and invite all our college <coughs> partners, and then once Lanarkshire's up and running, we'll have things at Lanarkshire as well. Um, but for me, that's a development in the right direction, but my opinion is that there's not a lot of integration between the schools, colleges and universities. Because if a student's at a college just now and has their support in place, the expectation might well be, well, automatically be at the university when I turn up in day one. And I don't think there's a free flow of information that passes forward. And I think that would need to be looked at. And the same with the DSA, in terms of the funding aspects, it is quite sometimes late for students to get their funding. Um, so I feel as though, yes, we can engage, we can have the information, information and guidance, guidance, look at the websites, but I think it's getting out there and speaking and raising the profile of what provision available is for the students. Yeah. Is that generally the position of the others, would you say? Certainly, Edinburgh, the, the Student Disability Service is always um, open for open days when students and their families come to see the university is part, I guess, of their decision of whether to, whether or not to apply, um, and that would be either people coming to the service and having a, a chat with one of our advisors, or actually having information stands and so on and so forth at various points throughout the university. Um, yeah, I, I I think it's in addition um, some of the points that Kirsty made. You know, it's it's. Our widening access people do a lot of work with schools um, and there's just the usual kind of uh, information on websites, leaflets, um, email inquiries, our students association. I think there'd probably be a lot of discussion these days on social media uh, about um, choice of universities not being a user of such. I'm, I, I couldn't say with any degree of certainty, but I, I think that would be where a lot of information, or certainly anecdotally, that would be where a lot of information for students is, is kind of bandied about, if you like. Carol? Yeah. Um, Yes, certainly we are very much aware that you know students that are looking to have a university experience are not engaging in gathering information in their final years of school. You know, the information search goes on much earlier than that. And we've certainly at Aberdeen we've invested very recently in trying to make our the information we have on our website more accessible um, and enable those visiting our website to have multiple ways of communicating and engaging with us so that we'll have real live chats, we'll, we're kind of available um, to talk to um, potential students asking inquiries. We're trying to manage and navigate their journey well before that they're applicants and ensure that they have a mechanism to find out the, the detailed information that they might require. So like the other universities, we are keen to ensure that when students visit us on campus, whether that's an individual personalised visit or through open days, applicant days or articulation arrangements um, with progression from, from college, that our full range of services are made available to our visitors so that they can access, they can access them whilst they visit our campus or they can make appointments to access them when they come and visit, but the choice, the choice is theirs. Okay. 
Have right. time for one more question? Quickly, yeah. Right. It, it's about personal statements, uh, and some of your submissions refer to these. I suppose this question is, is a general question and not specifically about disability. Do each of your institutions use personal statements in the admissions process? And how can students and their families be sure that that's being objectively treated? And is it, is it accountable and how is it scrutinised so that we know that it's a fair system that you're applying? Carol. Um, yes, at the University of Aberdeen, we are reading the personal statement and we are reading the reference. It's really the only opportunity that an applicant has to tell us their story. And they may not use other aspects of the application uh, to give, ne give information. They may use the personal statement instead of answering other questions. Uh, and so if you don't pick up the information that has been presented there, then you're <coughs> failing in your responsibilities to um, give equal consideration to all of the applications that you've received. The personal statement we are aware is something that causes quite a lot of anxiety amongst all applicants um, because they are aware that universities will use them in different ways. Um, and most universities will have statements either on their web pages, in their prospectus, uh, and also on UCAS that will explain how those personal statements are used. We do a lot of outreach activity, working with schools, um, particular schools um, through our widening access as well to explain the kind of things that we're looking for in the personal statement. And you will not find that all the universities in Scotland are asking for identical personal statements. So yes, we are looking for an indication of um, an interest in the subject that a student is applying for, but they do have five choices in their application and therefore the personal statement might not fit all of the, their choices. Uh, and again, there's been wider consultation with UCAS to see, well, how can we uh, improve that experience for applicants so that throughout their journey, if they're not holding any offers for whatever reason, can a new personal statement be submitted that better fits the choices that they're making later in the application cycle? Um, so we try to give as much as possible, as much as we can, direction on what we are looking at or looking for in the personal statement. And because we have centralised admissions and because we have dedicated members of staff who've been working in admissions for a considerable amount of time and undergo um, training on a regular basis, um, we have a small group that are looking at each of the applications so that we're hoping that there is commonality um, allocated across all of the applications that, 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 is, that, that are received. At the end of the day, there they're pretty subjective, really, in, in terms of how they're treated. I mean, how, what I'm worried about and concerned about is how can students who perhaps don't get accepted to one of your institutions and someone who perhaps does with exactly the same qualifications, how do we know that there's fairness being applied there? Well, if they have the same qualifications, it's unlikely that two different decisions will be made. Oh, right. Oh. That's interesting. But you can't, I mean, there's a limited number of places. The, 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 yes, and, and there may well be other factors mm. that will be taken mm. into account yes. to assess that application. Mm. So, um, yes, you have, a, you have um, commonality amongst the, the profile of qualifications, for example, for students that are um, applying for, for uh, programmes like medicine. Um, but there are other factors in the admissions process that are taken into account, not just the personal statement and not just the, the reference. So there's other factors taken into account, such as the interview process, that helps to present um, the full picture with regards to that. With the could I just press on that? In, in responding to a student who has perhaps been turned down yes. for something like medicine, <coughs> it's simply a letter back saying, sorry, you didn't get in. There's no detailed explanation of 
here's how we looked at your personal statement, here's what we scored and put positively yeah. and so on. It's simply a letter that comes back saying, sorry. Well, it wouldn't be it at the University of Aberdeen because right, so there's a different yes because they will they will get um, an ex you know so um, applications to medicine if they're not being brought forward for an interview they are they they are um, given feedback on why they are not being brought forward for an interview there will be specific uh, there will be a specific explanation that is particular to that applicant and that will be detailed. Um, to them in the decision that is communicated to UCAS. Those who are invited for interview and are not made an offer after the interview also receive feedback as to why they were not made an offer of admission. Okay, it okay. doesn't mean that they're not qualified, but as you'll be no, aware, not, medicine is a plan. controlled subject area and we have a limited number of places. Yeah. It'd be available. interesting to pursue that another yeah, opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. We're just about over over our time. Aye. Annie, Aye. I don't know if you want to get in with a question. Just a very quick one on the back of Willie's. Um, we were say, Willie was saying about the sort of personal statements, and you were saying it's written submissions. Do you do other submissions as well, like BSL submissions and video submissions, the way that the Royal Conservatoire were saying that you would look at various different aspects to set exams, you would take recordings and videos, <laughs> Would that be something that we do for personal statements for someone who maybe doesn't write in English as a first language if they're a BSL user? Is that something that is common amongst personal statements? At UWS, we certainly had instances of applicants contacting us to see could they put an alternative format in, and we would engage with the school. And in my experience, I've not had a school saying, no, it's not possible. Mm -hmm. um, we obviously have interviews and auditions for quite our creative programmes, and there's film reels, so they, they do have access to provide alternatives. Um, but it's not been mainstream as such, mm -hmm. but we do ha have an experience of a few people coming forward. And I mean, do we think it should be something that we should be saying during an interview? Because we're obviously trying to get people to declare disabilities at the, at the application stage. Mm -hmm. So if they're declaring it, a disability at the application stage, should we be saying, if this is something you're declaring, please, you, this, there's other ways for you to do your personal statement? Because I think that that would maybe make people feel maybe more um, more likely to apply for courses rather than having to write something down, especially if it is sort of a dyslexia or something like that. They could be very articulate at speaking, and it may make their application more more success, make them feel a bit more confident, confident in putting the application forward. It's a really interesting point, absolutely, and I think, you know, something we can take back to UCAS, and obviously we all have our own online application systems as well, and it's something mm -hmm. we can look at for our own institutions too. One, one particular issue on that aspect it was that had arisen last week from a BSL user who was um, a witness at our uh, inquiry last week, said that if the opportunity to do the, the application in BSL was available, yes. but also the issue about what's available on your website for people, yeah. that there's not much on BSL Still. or it's not signposted no. very well within the website to be found easily uh, by someone who uses BSL. So again, just that's, that's just feedback that we've had that maybe you can consider mm -hmm. uh, in, in your work going forward. We're, we're, we're well, well over a time for you this morning and, and you've been very patient because you've, you've stayed with us for for, for um, a, a long time this morning. We're really grateful for your evidence to us this morning. You've given us some very clear points that I think we will we will be following up uh, uh, as part of the, the committee inquiry. And if you go away and you think I should have said that, please get back in touch with us. I think we'll be happy to hear from you. So thank you so much for your evidence this morning. Thank you. Um, I'm going to move into... Uh, private session, so I'm going to suspend committee now. We will be starting back sharp at 11am, but we've got a bit of work to do in the private session as well, so thank you so much, and we'll go into...